It's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker today is Pascal Lefebvre, and he's going to talk about absolutely summing composition op operators and block spaces. Pascal, please. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Javad, for the opportunity to talk about this work here. Okay, so, uh, oh, so it doesn't work. Yes, okay. Uh, so I, I just start with some okay standard notation. So D is obviously the, the unit disk, like uh, Isabel used in her talk. Uh, T for the torus, the boundary. I will uh, use the notation A for the normalized the remeasure on the unit disk. And uh, with no surprise, I'm going to talk about uh, composition operators. And uh, so once you, even if I get that quite everybody here knows the, the subject uh, very quickly. So the symbol phi from the unit disk to the unit disk is analytic analytic function. And you're given uh, a space of uh, analytic function X on D and you're interested in uh, this operator. So to uh, an arbitrary function f in x, you're interested in the composition of uh, f with uh, phi, and then you're in maybe in x, for instance, in the talk of Isabel, uh, x was uh, h2, the hardy space, and uh, this is the result that indeed uh, uh, the composition uh, of f with uh, phi is uh, in h2, but Sometimes you're interested in uh, some other space and um, you're interested in uh, various uh, properties. So uh, what are the, maybe the, the most natural question in, around this topic? So first of all, is uh, the operator bounded, actually defined and bounded? And you're interested in some standard properties of operators and maybe one of the most famous is compact, but more widely you're uh, interested in the, the link between the operator C phi and the, the symbol, the property of the function phi. And according to me, it's what is very interesting, interesting in this uh, uh, area. It's the, the bridge, I could say the write a kind of dictionary between the uh, properties of the operator, so from uh, operator theory and the properties of the function. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about some results around nuclear and absolutely summing operators. I'm obviously going to, to explain what our nuclear is quite famous, maybe less absolutely summing operators and uh, to focus on uh, block type uh, spaces. So uh, block type spaces, uh, given a parameter, uh, the, the block, uh, block space with index uh, beta is uh, the space of analytic function on the, in the unit disk. And uh, you, you ask for control of the derivative with some radial weight. And here we, we shall focus on standard radial weights, uh, one minus uh, modulus of z to the square uh, to, to, to beta. And uh, since the condition concerns only the derivative for to, to define the norm, you, you add a, a term it's here. It, Deals the value at the region, and you have uh, the separable uh, counterpart of the block space, the so-called the, the called sorry uh, little block space uh, B not beta, which is a closed subspace of uh, the block space with index beta, and you ask to have. Uh, uh, that the, the limit of this quantity vanish at the boundary. Uh, and actually that's the, the closure of the polynomial for, uh, for, for the norm 
of course you 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 keep the same norm. And for beta equal to one, you have the classical block spaces, uh, the block space B, and uh, the, the classical little block space uh, B not. <coughs> Those are Banner spaces, and uh, actually you have uh, an ordered family of uh, of spaces. Uh, either considering the, the block spaces or considering the, the little block spaces. So I'm talking to you sometimes maybe uh, H infinity, which is quite of course, uh, well known. And uh, if you, you, you want to make a link between comparison between H infinity and the block space, then you have to, to differentiate according to the value of beta relatively to one. And uh, the fact that every bounded function uh, on the unit disk belongs to the classical block space and hence to the, to, to the block space with index larger than one is just a consequence of the Schwarzbeck lemma. Okay, uh, the, the first inequality here is just obvious because of the, the value of beta larger than one. The second inequality, this is a Schwarzbeck lemma, and then it's okay, less than one if you took some function uh, uh, bounded uh, uniformly by, by one. So actually you have a control by two uh, if you want to, to control the, the norm in, in the block space uh, with the, the norm of F. Uh, of course, uh, these are not the same spaces, and here you have the, the standard counter example of uh, a function belonging to the block space, the classical block space, and not to H infinity. And if you are interested in the little values of the parameter beta, then you have an inclusion, but in on the it's this time it's B beta, which is included in. H infinity and actually included in the in the disk algebra. Okay, maybe I want to to recall some let's say basic facts. I would say basic just in the use I will give. Maybe some of them are not so so obvious when you want to prove them. But okay, so the the dual of the little. Uh, block space is actually the classical Bergman space, whatever the value of the parameter, uh, and the dual of the uh, Bergman space is isomorphic to the block space B, B beta. Uh, okay, as stated here, it looks like a theoretic result of uh, isomorphism. Actually, the isomorphism is just the representation of the, of the duality I don't write explicitly here, but it's just, okay, roughly speaking, an integration uh, over D against the, the suitable radial weight uh, on, uh, with the array measure. Uh, a less uh, standard may be a result, but we shall use it uh, in the sequel. Uh, that the fact that uh, the block space is isomorphic to the sequence space L infinity. Uh, and uh, of, of course, there is a link too with the duality I just mentioned because the Bergman space is uh, actually isomorphic to little L1, the sequence space little L1. But I really wanted to, to mention these two facts. Uh, in For the standard block spaces, I guess it's quite old now, maybe it comes back to Linen Trospeuchinsky, I'm, I'm not sure, but for some versions with, um, with the weights, with radial weights, it probably goes back to Lusky, some, some work of Lusky. Okay, uh, let's go back to, to composition uh, operators. Uh, Actually, they, they are bounded, and once again, that's a consequence of uh, on the classical uh, uh, block space. Sorry. So it's uh, always bounded, and once again, it's a consequence of the Schwarzbeck uh, inequality. Uh, so 
you consider the crucial quantity to, to test if you're in the block space and you just write it in another way as a product of these two quantities. And clearly the, the first term is bounded just because phi is an analytic function from the unit disk to the unit disk. So it's in H infinity with norm less than one. And so as we just mentioned, uh, the, so this first term is less than one by the Schwartz peak inequality. And the second term, it's bounded because we, we took some function that didn't say who is F in this story, but here we, we, we took a function F in the classical block space. So this second term by definition is bounded and so okay we, we just proved that uh, composition operators on the classical block space is uh, is bounded but okay i just mentioned that we we are going to not look at the not only at the uh, classical block space but the weighted uh, block spaces standard weighted block spaces and then you have some contributions from okay, several uh, authors and I just mentioned some of them. Um, okay, probably there are more than them with some contribution around the boundedness. So if you are interested in the composition operators, but from one weighted block space to another with maybe another index, then you have a condition to be bounded and uh, that's the one I just written here uh, so that according to the values of mu of, of beta it can be automatically uh, fulfilled but not always of course and uh, so you have this uh, condition for the boundedness and the uh, block spaces and if you want to look at the situation for the little block spaces then you have the same condition but you have to to add another one uh, of course the when you look just see phi of the function these and you you get phi and you must have phi in the in the space uh, be be not beta and the condition is not always fulfilled. So you have to, to add this one. Actually, the, the two conditions together are, are sufficient. Uh, in, in the work of these authors, you have more more information, uh, but I just mentioned these two the facts. Okay, uh, we, we mentioned compactness as the first uh, important uh, property to, to look at. So, Actually, on the classical block spaces, the, the characterization of compactness of C5 was settled by Madigan and Matheson in the 90s. And uh, once again, I will give the, the, the result um, when you look the composition operators from uh, B mu to B, B beta or the little block uh, spaces and if you want to recollect the, the result of Madigan Matheson, just take mu and beta equal to, to, to one, of course, but it, it carry the, the, the result. And uh, as you saw in the previous slide, and here I, I just made some color in blue just to insist on something which is a, a quite um, common phenomenon around the composition operators. The boundedness was linked to some quantity with a big O condition, bounded condition we, we had in the previous slide. And here you see that the same quantities with, but written with some little O condition. Uh, so the limit uh, on the boundary is, uh, is zero. Uh, that's very often the spirit in this kind of rhythm that, of course, you have to, uh, the, where, where it's very delicate situation that's around the, the, the boundary. 
Okay. And that's what we see uh, here. And I would like to, to focus uh, here on some examples. So I'm, I'm not sure, I uh, don't know if it was mentioned before, but actually it's easy to, to see that if you, you take a symbol not touching the boundary at all, in the meaning that you are, let's say, far from the boundary, the infinite norm of phi is strictly less than one. And uh, okay, as we mentioned, let's say that phi is in uh, B beta, uh, then the operator is compact on uh, B beta. Actually, it's very, very compact. It's, I should say, extremely compact. It's a nuclear operator. I'm going to focus on nuclear operators in, uh, very shortly. But then, okay, it's not hard to, to, to show that it's compact, even okay, of, it's obvious with the criterion, but want to mention even without knowing the, the characterization, you, you can show that. And uh, as I mentioned, the delicate thing is around the boundaries. So do we have some examples of compact composition operators uh, touching the, the boundary? And maybe at first uh, on the, when, when we look the, the operator on the classical block, block space. So I immediately, immediately forget, of course, the identity, which is clearly not compact here. But okay, uh, uh, first idea is to, to look at some circle, if you have in mind the phi of D. So that's, for instance, here the symbol. Uh, Z plus one over two. And uh, you have uh, here a, a drawing of uh, the image of uh, phi. But it's quite easy. And once again, of course, the characterization show that, but even without the characterization, you, you can show very easily that it's not compact. So now let's look at another example, which is quite famous in the theory of composition operators. So that's the, the lens map. So I, I gave the formula, you, you're given a parameter so between zero and one, uh, not one, you, you would get the identity, but let's say theta strictly less than one. And uh, kappa here is the, the Kelly transform. So to, to explain how you, you, you get that, you, you first um, map the Kelly transform. So you go from the uh, unit disk to the right half plane. And once you're in the right half plane, you take V to the theta. So have, you, you shrink your right half plane into, uh, into a sectorial uh, area domain. Okay, and then with the inverse of the KLA transform, you, you come back to, into the, the unit disk. And so you, you get such a, such a map. And if you, you do the, the picture of phi of D, then you, you, you get this, uh, this picture. Uh, so for instance, for instance, to, to make a link with the, the previous talk of Isabel on H2, uh, the, the lens map, uh, the action of the lens map is very well known. So it's compact and actually it's, I should say once again, very compact, it's nuclear and so on. We, we shall see uh, in, in this talk that in the situation on block spaces is very different. And uh, for instance, we, we pointed out uh, uh, yes, I, I forgot to, to mention that the results here are some results obtained with my uh, former PhD student, Tony Fares. So we, we pointed out that when the parameter is strictly less than one, then actually it's not bounded. Simply the, the map do not belong to B beta. So okay, boundedness and end of story in that case. 
it's bounded we, we are, uh, for the classical uh, block space we, we mentioned that it's always bounded so of course it's bounded but we can show to even by hand uh, to say that it's not compact and what is according to me interesting that when the parameter is strictly larger than one then then you get a, a compact uh, composition uh, of a we shall see some other phenomenon at the at the end of the of the talk around this uh, lens map. But still, if you wanted to produce uh, a particular example in the classical uh, for the classical block space of a compact operator, but with symbol touching the the boundary, then okay, here it doesn't work uh, with this uh, kind of map. For the classical block space, and um, so so maybe have in mind the the first picture with the circle. So we we had a at point one tangent uh, uh, area, okay, and with the lens map, I should come back. Then you see that around point one, it's in some sectorial. Uh, domain, so it touches in a more smoothly way uh, the the boundary. But here you see the new drawing with the cursed map. It's even a, a slighter way to to touch the the boundary. So the what is a cursed map? You you first you 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 ask for two things. First, you have to be in a sectorial, like the lens map, actually. But the second condition is given by the distance of a point into the phi of D to the boundary. And it has to be little o of the distance from W to, to 1. So you have this kind of picture. OK? And then it was a result of Madigan and Matheson in the work I already mentioned around compactness that uh, on uh, uh, the classical block space, then you have a, uh, you have a compact uh, operator. And so you, you, you produce, you can produce uh, a symbol touching the, the unit circle at some point uh, but inducing a, a compact composition operator. For instance, when you're in each infinity, it's completely forbidden. Composition operators compact on each infinity, then you must have the infinite norm of the symbol strictly less than one. So the situation is really different here. But there is, a, uh, according to me, a very maybe more striking example because you, you see that on the, the drawing, you, you touch very smoothly the, the boundary at point one. And then you could think that it, it's forbidden to fulfill the, the disk, for instance, but actually not. There is an example of uh, Wayne Smith in the, in the 90s too, that you can have an inner function, actually a Blaschke product. So okay, maybe not D, but almost D, let's say, uh, says so that you, you get a compact composition uh, operator. And this situation here, it's, uh, for instance, forbidden for hardy spaces. Uh, once again, if we make the link with the composition operators on H2, uh, mentioned by uh, Isabel, then you, you cannot a Blaschke product cannot induce a, a compact composition operator on, on H2. But here uh, it's possible, and okay, it's a nice example, according to me. Okay, so I, I already mentioned several times the uh, nuclear operators, and we are going to record what uh, with the compact uh, uh, nuclear sorry, operators. So, when you have some arbitrary banner spaces, how to produce uh, just, uh, let's say, even a bounded operator in full generality? Okay, you have the identity, 
uh, lambda times identity. And, and then it's not so obvious if you maybe even do not have any basis or I don't know. So you have the functionals, you have therefore the, the rank one operators, the sum of rank one operators, and then you can have the L1 sum of rank one operators and for generality it's not so obvious to produce some other kind of operators. And uh, so if you do it this way, actually you have uh, not only a bounded operators, but a compact operator at the limit of uh, finite rank operators. And uh, so that the definition for an arbitrary, uh, from, for an operator between arbitrary spaces, banal spaces X and Y, it's uh, said to be nuclear if you have a, a sequence of functionals on uh, y, uh, uh, X, sorry, and a, a sequence in Y with such a strong condition of uh, summability of the norms, and T is given by this. Uh, absolutely convergent uh, sum of uh, rank one operators. So as I mentioned, uh, they are compact uh, in, a, in a very strong uh, sense. And the other kind of uh, operators I want to talk today are the P-summing operators. I just wrote well-known, but okay. Uh, it was for P equal to, to one, I'm going to, to give the definition and a few properties to maybe well understand uh, how it works. For P equal to one, it was introduced by uh, Grothendieck so a long time ago, and for arbitrary values of P, it comes back to, to, to the late uh, 60s and mainly the 70s uh, in many work of, around the geometry of banal spaces. Okay, what is the, the definition? Uh, for an arbitrary P larger than uh, one, then uh, an operator T uh, from X to Y is uh, P summing or P absolutely summing. If you have this condition, okay? Uh, so let's say it means that you have a, a LP summable sequence of uh, XG in the weak sense. And then when you look at the images of T of X, G, but then you have a LP sum in the strong sense. Okay, the, the, uh, the second equality, which is very often useful, is just a, a rephrasing using the linearization of uh, the LP sum and uh, mainly Anbana. Okay, just another way to, to, to see it. But okay, the, the definition is okay when we discover it uh, the first time for arbitrary values of p, uh, maybe it's not so easy to understand what what does it mean. So maybe I want to to start with a, a generic example. We, we shall explain why it's a generic example and simple one. Just take a compact space and the probability measure on k. And you look at the, the identity, the formal identity from C of K to the LP space associated to K and, uh, and this probability measure. And it's a, it's a P summing operator and it's very, very easy to, to check. Just uh, check the definition. So you take the, the LP sum of the FG in LP, but then the LP norm to the P, it's very easy to, to sum because you, you have the integral. And so you, you take, obviously, uh, interpreting the integral and the sum, the second term, but then it's quite finished already because you, the, the function inside the sum of the modulus of the AG to the P, then you, you can get an upper estimate with a supremum over uh, the point W on K, and uh, you get this estimates uh, with, uh, okay, the, the mu of K is one. We, we took here probability measure. We, of course, we could use only a positive finite measure and get something P summing, but okay, I took something with probability measure. 
you, you see with the definition that if you restrict the operator, then clearly the condition in the definition is still fulfilled. So by restriction, you, you keep the, the property of being p-summing. And if you compose your operator or left or right, then you, you still have a, a p-summing operator. You have the, okay, just the ideal property. So from this uh, generic example, by restriction and composition, you can have uh, many, uh, many other uh, examples. And uh, we, we are going to, to explain uh, shortly that actually they are all like that, the pisamin operator. But first, uh, maybe, sorry, once again, when you see the definition for arbitrary P, once again, I think at first sight, it's not easy to, to understand what, okay, how does it work? But if you take the particular value of P equal to one, then it says some things, it's actually equivalent to saying that if you have an unconditional convergence series in X, then for the T of Xn, you have an absolute uh, convergence series, okay? Um, Okay, let's say that P summing is just the LP version of that. And uh, so it's very easy to, to check in one line that nuclear operators are one summing. Uh, and you, you could expect maybe that it's uh, more than compact being uh, one summing mainly because I, I, I just mentioned compactness at the beginning and very compact and so on. So in full generality, one summing does not imply uh, compact. Just think to the, uh, the example I just gave. If you take the formal identity from C over zero one to the classical uh, L1 space with the Lebesgue measure, measures, then you have a one summing operators, which is clearly not compact. So, so it's full generality, it's not, it's not compact, but here we, we are going to focus on um, block spaces uh, or little block spaces, isomorphic to C naught Ln infinity. And it turns out that when X is C naught, then one summing implies nuclear. And so it implies compact. And uh, when it's L infinity, we have the, the same result. So, in our framework here uh, on uh, block spaces, uh, when you look at P summing, okay, now one summing operator, then it's indeed uh, uh, more than uh, compact, okay? Uh, I could mention too that one summing does not imply compact, but it does imply uh, weakly compact. I'm, I'm not going to talk about weak compactness here. Once again, uh, for instance, if you think to see C, C not weak, uh, weak compactness implies compactness by the show property of the dual of uh, C not. So, okay, weak compactness and compactness, that's mainly the, the same thing in this framework too. Okay, uh, with the definition or with the, the very important result I'm going to state just after, it's easy to see that once you're P summing, then you're Q summing for larger values of uh, when Q is larger than P. And uh, to really explain how another point of view on P summing operators, and actually it's a characterization, it's a very, very important result uh, of this topic. That's a pitch domination theorem, uh, which states that if you are uh, absolutely summing, if and only if, for some probability measure on the unit ball of the dual liquid with the weak star topology, you have such uh, an upper estimate. So in terms of the integral over, the, over this uh, unit ball against this uh, probability measure. But I, I would like to, to explain that actually that's a factorization result. Indeed, if you see your Barnard space uh, and I, uh, up to an isometric uh, uh, copy, it's a subspace of the space of continuous function over the unit ball of the dual space. 
Okay, so it's subspace of a C of K. And then consider, up to now, consider any probability measure on this particular compact. So we explained that GP and here the restriction of uh, the formal identity to this, uh, to, to the LP space of a mu is P summing. So up to now, considering any probability measure on this uh, unit ball of the dual, you, you get uh, you, you get a P summing operators. But what explains the pitch domination theorem is if you take uh, a good probability measure, a suitable one, then you can come back with something which is roughly speaking, the action of T to Y. Okay, so, so this upper estimate actually uh, translates into a factorization theorem. Uh, being P summing, it's roughly speaking to be able to factorize maybe not through the formal identity from C of K to some LP of K, but to the restriction of such operators. So that's why the, the, the example was so, so important. Okay, so of course you, you understood that we were interested in one, uh, the composition over block spaces uh, viewed on block spaces is P summing and with uh, Tony, we, we obtained the full characterization. So given any P larger than one, any parameters mu and uh, beta, then uh, the composition operator C, C phi is, uh, P summing, if and only if the restriction to the little block is P summing, and if and only if you have uh, such a, a characterization, I wrote it this way to put in the middle the quantity you saw in the characterization of compactness. So there is a power to the P. You see something uh, kind of weight, but you have a supremum. Uh, on D over D, and you have the hyperbolic measure uh, on the unit disk uh, for the integration. And if you just add the condition that phi was in the little block, then that's the same that the composition between little block spaces are P summing. And uh, actually, we, we first were interested in the nuclear composition operator on the classical block space. So it was in the previous work. So for P and mu and beta equal to one. Once again, uh, one summing, which is turned out to be equivalent to nuclear uh, here, uh, but only for the block classic, classical block spaces, we had a characterization and here is the generalization uh, with the, um, okay. The, the fact that you, you generalize with the indexes is not so hard, but the very technical part from passing from P equal one to arbitrary P is really for to, to get the P. It's not, just not formal. And okay, maybe I will just give an idea about uh, how we you have the, the, the condition and, how you have the idea of the condition. So I'm just going to explain how works the necessary condition from let's say two. Once you know if the composition operator is P summing from the block space or simply use from the little block, how you, you get the, the condition. So how you get the condition, you, you use the pitch theorem so far let's say rather theoretic, but, but still existing, uh, probability measure on the unit ball of the dual, you have such a, an upper estimate, okay? And uh, we shall use to description of the dualities of the, actually to, to have a, a functional on the, on the block space with parameter mu, it's the same as to be given uh, a function in the Bergman space, the classical Bergman space, and here the, the bracket is a duality bracket relatively to the, to the block space with parameter mu. 
and you apply this to this function. So it means that you fix some W in the unit disk and you consider this function, which is in the block space. And actually once W is fixed, it's a bounded function. And what you get uh, when you, you want to, to see the action of uh, the functional C over this function and uh, relate C to the, to the H, the Bergman function. Actually, so you have this weight. Okay, don't, don't forget that P prime is P over P minus one. So that uh, to the power P, that's why we, we get this uh, P minus one. So the one minus W to the square, we did nothing except uh, considering the power. But then the action of uh, the function one over one minus uh, uh, the conjugate of WZ to the power one plus mu against H and using the duality bracket and the reproducing kernel formula in, in a way you, you have the H of W. And here is a trick. Um, you use the fact that your H in the Bergman space, so you have H of W, and you use that you, you know the, the norm of the point evaluation, but not for all of them, just for the P minus one proportion of this uh, term uh, H of W to the P. And that's why the, you don't see anymore the, the first thing because it was the, okay, the, the norm of, the point evaluation is one over one minus uh, W to the square. So that's why you get that. And then using that and iterating what you, you got, uh, then you, you get this estimate on the left-hand side. You have nothing but the, the, the norm in the, the block space with parameter uh, uh, beta of C phi of F of, sub w and then the integration so it's just a rewriting and then on the right hand side you have an upper estimate and then you you took the integral of a w and then was the l1 norm of h so over d so once again the bergman norm and the, the norm of h is less than one so the right hand side is bounded and so you you get the you get the upper estimate and the necessary condition. So to show that it's sufficient, it's quite technical. And I, okay, I don't uh, give the details here. Uh, have to, okay, I have a few minutes yet. So um, we, we weren't still interested in, okay, I, I mentioned some symbol touching the boundary and uh, uh, being compact, can we have a nuclear operator uh, touching the boundary and still being compact? So using the characterization and using the idea of Madigan and Matheson, but then you have to, to impose not on, only a, com, uh, a condition with little o of uh, the distance to the point one, but such a condition which uh, make that you, you have to, to flatten uh, very much your cusp uh, when, uh, when you are close to, to one, uh, but yet you, you, you get a, a nuclear operator touching the boundary on the, on the classical block space. And uh, actually, the, the, if you want to get an inner symbol, maybe a Blaschke product, then, of course, you, you think to the, the example of Wayne Smith, but it doesn't work, unfortunately. But still, there is a, a symbol, a phi inert. So actually, it's a Blaschke product using a nuclear operator. But on B beta, when beta is larger than one, and you can show that there is no such example for an inner function, not only Blaschke product when the parameter is strictly less than one. And uh, okay, as I mentioned, the example of uh, Wayne uh, Smith doesn't work, but there is a result of uh, Alexander Anderson Nicolaou, um, 
who constituted some uh, slow hyperbolic uh, Blaschke product. And so you, okay, you can produce such an example thanks to their results. And uh, okay, uh, once again, using some cusp, uh, we, we were able to product a compact one, which is not p summing for any value of p. So, uh, so you have to flatten a bit to be little o to fulfill the madigan matheson condition, but then uh, this integral is nothing that uh, a condition to, to be sure that our characterization, the condition in our characterization won't be fulfilled for any p. And so you think for log log function uh, in your, uh, in the, for the, the curve um, in your cusp map, then, uh, then you can produce such an example. So I just have a very few minutes left, uh, I think. And uh, okay, I think that according to the title of the conference with the composition, I, I'm okay, but I didn't mention anything about semi-groups. So I will do it very quickly now and come back to the lens map uh, semi-groups. So just, I, I, I just record the drawing and how it was defined. So since maybe mainly uh, when you were in the right half plane, you, you took some power, then you, you have this kind of property on the symbol, phi, phi theta prime composed with phi theta, you have phi theta theta prime. So it's not a semi-flow like uh, Isabel mentioned, you have a product, not a sum, <coughs> sorry. But then once you are given theta, actually you can embed it in the semi-group, just taking theta to the t for some positive t. Actually, I could take t equal to zero. Yeah, then I have the identity. So you have the semi-group uh, property. And uh, to, to relate it to, to our results, when you have, uh, we, we mentioned uh, in one slide that for the classical, uh, block space, it's bounded, but not compact. So it cannot be a P summing. But when the parameter beta is strictly larger than one, then the lens map is P summing when P is large enough with, the, with this condition on theta related to, to beta two. So that for, uh, uh, therefore you, when theta is small enough, relatively to beta, you get a nuclear operator on B beta. Um, once again, maybe to, to mention what is the situation with the Hardy space, the, the lens map, I mentioned it, but I, I will call it now. Any lens map on H2, uh, it induces a, a nuclear operator for any theta, actually. So, so here we, Actually, I don't know. I mean, it's a sufficient condition, but I, I don't know if it's necessary, but it would be a surprise that you, it's for any uh, uh, theta, you, ha you have such a, a property. So just rephrasing in the language of semi-groups, you have, a, a, so the lens map semi-group is eventually p-summing. And so with the definition that I gave, it's p-summing for a t large enough relatively to, to P and beta, and it's eventually a nuclear, uh, once again, with this condition. And it would be interesting to, to know what is the optimal value of the parameter to get a P-summing or a nuclear one. And uh, I think, okay, it's three minutes too, too much, sorry, but thank you very much. Thank you indeed, Pascal. Let's thank the speaker first. Is there any question or comments for Pascal? Since I don't see all, all the participant, if there is any, please go ahead.
It seems not. So let's thank him again for his wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you, indeed, Pascal. We 